So welcome everyone to another episode of the I Am All Ears podcast. I am Rohit and I'm co-hosting this episode with my friends uh, Shrujal and Sushant. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sam Vaknin, uh, an exceptional intellectual and a genius in the truest definition of the word. He was born in Israel and started university at the age of nine and he completed his PhD in quantum mechanics by the age of 22. He's a graduate in finance and is also certified in psychological counseling and has also served in the Israeli Defense Force. He has played numerous, uh, many roles uh, in his career. Uh, some of them are being co-owner and director of multiple businesses, being a financial consultant, also playing a role in the investment management arena, being an economic advisor to the Ministry of Finance and the government of Republic of Macedonia. He's also a noted columnist and last but not least, also an author. He's the leading expert on narcissistic personality disorder and has written several books on the topic. The notable one being Malignant Self-Love, uh, Narcissism Revisited. Currently, he's a professor of finance and a professor of psychology. I first discovered uh, Dr. Wagner's work while researching the effects of uh, social media after I'd taken a month-long social media detox. And uh, Sam, I found, has an amazing ability to connect with various domains of knowledge like economics, history, social sciences, psychology, physics, and put all of this together and offer a unique perspective with an amazing sense of humor. So thank you for being on the show. And Thank you for having me. You almost, yeah. you almost convinced me to listen to this guy. <laughs> uh, so I think before we dive into some of the main questions, I was just curious to uh, ask you one question on a bit of personal level is, uh, I think in one of your YouTube videos, you also mentioned that uh, you had an IQ tested uh, in I think 180 or 190. And I just wanted to know, like, uh, do you find any topic intellectually challenging or uh, is it like everything super easy or what what were what was difficult for you if there was something like in descending order women sports and cars <laughs> and what i've what okay. i've learned what i've learned over the years the three usually go together <laughs> i would call them a cluster a cluster of topics yeah. Yeah. that's that's the model we've all been exposed to right? Yeah. <laughs> yes right yeah you're so, sporty, uh, you have a car, you have the woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think our, our strategy for today, what we thought we could do best is we have uh, we've made a list of topics that we wanted to hear you speak about. So okay. we don't have very specific questions. So we're just going to shoot out like a general question about a theme uh, like cryptocurrencies or AI or psychology. And we let you speak, you know, like uh, if you want to go in depth about it, we don't mind going just one topic and you know if you share something and we ask more questions or we can we can just see how how it goes but it's completely up to you and to how much depth that you want to dive into um, free that. free range chickens are the tastiest <laughs> <laughs> yeah so no pressure on the time and okay so the first thing we wanted to talk to you was about uh, cryptocurrencies uh, I think uh, I or all of us we sort of find out this there's a lot of hype around these cryptocurrencies. And we wanted to know what are your thoughts on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and anything specific from like monetary and economic history that we could uh, look at you know, in, uh, in retrospect to this uh, situation of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is a very complex subject because it encompasses um, several dimensions of human experience, monetary policy, um, encryption and so on and so forth. Start with the fact that cryptocurrencies are the embodiment, the reification of a novel approach to identity verification. Mm -hmm. Encryp encryption has always been about identity verification, um, yet it had failed miserably uh, precisely because the, the algorithms um, were actually um, centralized. The, okay. <laughs> and so centralization, centralization is the enemy of anonymity and uh, is, is, the, is the friend of anonymity and, and the enemy of identity verification. 
What mm -hmm. blockchain had done, it had distributed, of course, identity verification. It had replicated it, so it created redundancy and so on and so forth. Now, it's very unfortunate, in my view, that the first, the first expression of this magnificent technology, which would revolutionize absolutely everything from identifying art, art provenance, to, mm -hmm. ident to identifying DNA, to identifying financial transactions, to and so on and so forth. It's very unfortunate that this technology, as many as have been many other technologies on the internet, has been hijacked uh, by less savory characters for less savory uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. And with this, I'm referring, of course, to cryptocurrencies. Can I just ask you something procedural? Um, yeah. it, dis it disrupts my flow of thought if you keep saying, mm -hmm -hmm. It, it, it's it's okay. a problem. Sorry, apologies. Okay. No, no, no worries. I understand. Okay. When, I, when I'm finished, I'll give you a clear signal that I'm finished. So okay. that, that way we, we will both be uh, able to maintain our trains of thoughts or we're going to have a train collision, which is, I heard, common in, in India, but still. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first issue, identity verification. But it's been hijacked by cryptocurrencies. Now, cryptocurrencies were actually a rebellion they were a rebellion against the monopoly of central banks. Central banks are a new invention, relatively speaking, in human terms. Uh, the first operating certain central bank is, is younger than 200 years old and, and arguably 100 years old. So it's a new invention. Centralizing the function of printing money, um, money supply, etc., etc., is a new concept and pretty counterintuitive if you come to think of it. Because various regions, various parts of Earth have dif differing needs. They don't have the same needs economically and financially. So why should a central entity dictate the money supply to all these regions uniformly? It runs counter not only to intuition, but to good economic sense. And yet, central banks have become the central feature of modern economics. And cryptocurrencies have been a distributed rebellion against the monopoly that central banks had on printing currencies. Why was such a rebellion needed and why did it take off uh, so successfully? Because central banks devolved their authority to commercial banks. They allowed commercial banks to print money. Commercial banks print money via their balance sheets and the central bank prints money via something called fiat, kind of um, artificial action on a ledger. And the result was, of course, that money was hijacked by commercial interests, avarice, greed, malfeasance, and um, the culmination, culmination of which was, for, was in 2008 in the financial crisis. It's not an accident of history that cryptocurrencies started their ascendance after the financial crisis because we have been disillusioned with the financial system as a matter of philosophy and principle, not disillusioned with specific action or specific outcome, but with a very philosophical foundation of our monetary system. In other words, with the very act of creating money. We reach the conclusion as individuals, as society, even I would say as regulatory authorities, that it might not be such a great idea to centralize the making of money or the creation of money in the hands of people who have conflicting or differing interests. Um, and so cryptocurrencies was a form of this rebellion. Unfortunately, and finally I'm, I'm answering your question, I should hope, unfortunately, cryptocurrencies were not created as stores of value. You see, Currents, the main function of a currency is to store value. Currencies are tiny containers that store, for example, work, work done. Tiny containers that store pieces of real estate, that store pieces of products. Um, currencies are containers of value and they store it and they are mobile. And so you can move this value around and exchange it and you don't do many things with it. Cryptocurrencies were not created as storage of value. They were not created as containers of value. They were created as containers of expectations. 
they, they are forms of storage of expectations. The cryptocurrency owner expects his currency to appreciate. He, the, the only value inherent in the cryptocurrency is its future appreciation. It has no other function. Indeed, until very recently, you couldn't do anything with a cryptocurrency. You couldn't buy anything, you couldn't sell anything, you couldn't do anything. And because cryptocurrencies were relegated to an obscure niche of the financial market, having not been created as stores of value, they fell in the hands of criminals, especially cyber criminals, and terrorists, and drug dealers, and other unsavory characters. And so now, cryptocurrencies have two economic functions, stores of expectations, which is a very nice way of saying gambling, simply gambling, gambling, speculation in the worst sense of the word. And the second economic function, it is the official, they are, sorry, cryptocurrencies are the official currencies of the underworld. I mentioned terrorists, I mentioned drug, drug kingpins and so on. I mentioned ransomware, I mean, I can mention ransomware, I can, they all use, they all use bitcoins or they all use Ethereum or they all use some, some other cryptocurrency. And this is where cryptocurrencies are at this stage. They also gave a bad name to the underlying blockchain technology because the most laymen and quite a few experts actually confuse cryptocurrencies with the blockchain technology, which is a wonderful, absolutely wonderful identity verification technology, possibly the first foolproof one or failproof one. Um, and that's where we are standing right now. Speculation plus um, malversation. Speculation plus crime. This is where cryptocurrencies are. Now, people are speculating about future value. This is not a pyramid scheme. Cryptocurrencies are not Ponzi schemes because there's no centralized authority that actually regulates the flow of information and the flow of expectations. The expectations are mass expectations. They are distributed expectations for the first time in human history, by the way. We have a situation where the pyramid or the Ponzi scheme is, is massive and global and generated by, by its very victims, in a way. And this is, a, this is the first time this happens in human history with regards to any form of storage of value. Even the tulip mania, I mean, the famous, the famous mania in, the, in 1648 in, in the Netherlands, there was a central authority. There was an exchange of tulips. We don't have this with uh, cryptocurrencies. It is the victims themselves. I'm, I'm calling them victims because they are bound to be victimized when, you know, when, when steam runs out. So the victims themselves are generating the, the, the Ponzi scheme or the pyramid scheme. And there's no precedent uh, to that. This reminds me tangentially of how I view narcissism. So I view Nazism as the first form of distributed religion. I think everything is distributed. You see, in every period in human history, we have a ruling metaphor. We have an overriding, overpowering metaphor. And the metaphor of our days is the network. That's our metaphor. Um, and so whatever we study, we use the network metaphor. When we study the brain, for example, we use the network metaphor. We talk about neural networks. When we study artificial intelligence, we use the network metaphor. When we create currencies, new currencies like cryptocurrencies, we create them um, uh, within networks. Everything is, you. I mean, the network metaphor is used to explain the world. It's an organizing principle, but also an explanatory hermeneutic principle, principle of in interpretation of understanding of imbuing our existence with meaning and so similarly i postulated that narcissism is a um, network a religious network metaphor but we can come to it separately okay uh that was that was fascinating the connection any, with, uh, any survivors uh, <laughs> yeah, still alive, still alive. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, temporary, believe me. The, yeah. <laughs> we just it there. Uh, do you think cryptocurrencies can ever become a store of value? 
in the no, future? No. no, okay. No, I don't think so. And I don't think so precisely because of the way they're structured. Store of value is critically dependent um, on, on centrality, on a value issuer or a value arbitrator. And that is, of course, the main role of central banks um, mm. and, and of commercial banks, admittedly, because even commercial banks arbitrate value. They, are, they determine value. So, for example, if you go to a, a commercial bank and ask for a loan, they go through a process called due diligence, which is essentially a process of determining value, whether you are so-called valuable. And the uh, central bank is doing it on the, on the level of the entire economy via its monetary um, tools. Governments do this. Governments are also value arbitrators. Actually, it's pretty easy to look at the entirety of human society and see that all centralized institutions revolve around value arbitration. The main thing they do, they arbitrate value. In other words, they create hierarchies. Now, networks are the, the antithesis, they are the, um, they are the, the opposite of, of hierarchies. And so in networks, there is no possibility to create value because every node is equal to every other node. The main principle of networks is equipotence. The, mm. minute, the minute every node is equal to every other node, there is no possibility for an asymmetry of value. There's no possibility for a cascade of value or, or, you know, there's no possibility for difference in potentials of value. So if I'm as valuable as you are and so on, so we actually cannot trade value. I cannot give you excess value. And what money is, is excess value. If I pay you $100 and you don't have these $100, you took them from me, I had on me. 100 units of excess value, for example, 100 units of work, 100 units of a product sold, whatever, but I had more value than you. That's why I was able to give you this value, to pay you, and this process is called payment. So payments are actually uh, the most primitive basic units of value arbitration, but payments are not possible in a network because there is no differential between the, of any kind between the nodes. All nodes are equipotent, equidistant, equi-everything. So either we create asymmetrical networks, in which case uh, we have created hierarchy. I mean, an asymmetrical network is hierarchy. And, and many, many human endeavors started off as networks and became asymmetrical hierarchical networks and in effect hierarchies. And perhaps the most famous example would be Wikipedia. Wikipedia started off, I know because I was among the founders, Wikipedia started off as an utter network, I mean total network. Actually, the, the, uh, what preceded Wikipedia was called Nupedia. And Nupedia um, was a network of scholars, That's, I, I was a member of Nupedia. Nupedia was a, a network of scholars, all of them equipotent, all of them, you know, classic network. And Wikipedia continued the tradition, and for many, many years, it, had, it was a totally, I mean, a, a total network concept, the reification of a network. But if you have a look at today's Wikipedia, it's very hierarchical, very. And they demand identity, in various stages of the process, they have administrators, they have editors and top editors and chief top editors and you name it. I mean, they look much more like the Washington Post than like a network. So many human endeavors start off as networks and degenerate into hierarchies or evolve into hierarchies, depending you know, which side of the political spectrum we are. And I think because cryptocurrencies are it cannot be divorced from the blockchain network concept. They can never become a, a store of value, only a store of expectations. That was fascinating. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Because I think uh, uh, at least all of us, when we, uh, I think that's also another flaw of the modern internet is that the hype 
uh, gets pushed up. So uh, the articles and videos that we always come across are, you know, like cryptocurrencies are going to be like the next big thing and it's going to revolutionize uh, uh, all these financial systems. And Facebook is now planning to launch its own cryptocurrency network. And 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 so I, do you think that this is just all a temporary thing and maybe in a couple of years this whole no. thing will just die down? No, no, absolutely not temporary. I did indicate that cryptocurrencies and the underlying technology is a revolution in many in many ways. And one of the most important ways that cryptocurrencies are revolutionizing, uh, but not our economy, <laughs> they're revolutionizing other things. One of the thing, one of the main features is the ability to store expectations. So when you go to a casino, you get jetons. They're like small, you know, chips. Yeah, you get chips. And you place the chips on the table, and if you're lucky, you know, you win, and if you're a regular Joe, you lose. Most people lose all the time. And these jetons, these coins, represent an exchange of value for expectations, because you give real money, and you get jetons, you get chips. The real money you gave, the $100 that you gave, they represent value. And you trade this value for chips. And these chips, or jetons as they're called in Europe, these casino chips, they represent your stake in expectations. What's the expectation? To win, of course. So here's an example of trading value for expectations. But the problem with casino chips is that, number one, they are limited to casinos. So they are still a form of centralized authority which issues expectations, manages expectations, even can reverse expectations, for example, if you win too much. So expectations within a casino are a local phenomenon and they are not pure, they are adulterated by commercial interests that underlie the expectations. Not so with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are the first, first product in human history that allows us to store expectations, trade them, convert them, exchange them, do anything we do with expectations that hitherto we were able to do only with value. And that's a massive, <laughs> possibly the second biggest revolution in, in human economics. I mean, I, I don't underestimate cryptocurrencies at all, but I think the important element of cryptocurrencies is the blockchain technology, which allows for identity verification. Why is that? Because expectations are a very are psychology. Value is not psychology. Value is the world. When you store value, you store a tiny piece of the world in a coin or in a note. When you store expectations, you, to, you store a tiny piece of a human soul, a tiny piece of human psychology in a coin or in a note, which in our case is, of course, totally digitized in a series of bits and bytes. So, but you still, what you're storing, what you're trading, what you're exchanging, etc., etc., is human psychology. No wonder that cryptocurrencies are amenable to changes in moods, changes in fashion, changes in human psychology, and to hype, because they are stores of human psychology. Um, when money started, when centralized money started, in about, let's say, the 13th or 14th century, ironically, it was also a store of expectations, not a store of value, because the first monies represented an expectation um, with regards to the future value of gold and silver. They were actually, the first coins were speculation on the future value of gold and silver. Gradually, we invented the note, the paper currency. And paper currencies, currencies also started off as stores of expectations. Why? Because the idea was that you could take the paper note, go to a bank, and get gold. That was the idea. All paper notes 
until essentially 1971 in the United States, for example, were convertible to gold, physical gold. It was a claim on the treasury. And so whenever we invent a store of value, it starts off as a, as a store of expectation and transformed into a store of value. And one would have assumed that this should happen with cryptocurrencies as well, but it will not because coins and paper currency were always linked to reality, to the real world. While cryptocurrencies are linked mostly to human psychological processes, they are pure expectations. And because coins and paper currency currencies were issued by centralized authorities, as I mentioned, cryptocurrencies are network creatures, network inventions, and therefore can never store value. So you're asking me if it's very important. Yes, of course, cryptocurrencies are a major revolution. Will it benefit its holders and buyers? And <laughs> I don't think so. I think ultimately what, ultimately, I mean, uh, the idea is people want ultimately to buy cars or to, you know, to do something with the money. So when it comes to this, there are quite a few obstacles, quite a few obstacles, not the least of which, and I think the major one actually, would be the opposition of the centralized issuers of money. If cryptocurrency, the minute cryptocurrencies threaten to become stores of value, God knows how, by the way, I don't see how the technology can support this, but let's assume it happens. Immediately, the central banks will ban it. It will become criminal, criminalized and legal. That's one thing. And the centralized issuers of money will take over cryptocurrencies as yet another monetary tool. This is happening, for example, in South Korea, in Russia, where they are planning their own cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrencies have no future. Either they become yet another monetary tool in the arsenal of central banks, in which case the, the small guys, I mean, have nothing from it. Or they will fail as a store of value, as I predict. In which case, of course, you know, they will be wiped, wiped off. But the legacy is there. We have been able, finally, to link safe, fail-proof identity verification, which was the main monopoly of central banks. Yes, We have been able to do this outside the confines of a centralized authority and to link it to human psychology. That's amazing. It's uh, absolutely one of the greatest revolutions in possibly human history. As you will see, I mean, you are young, you will see how many fields of life will be permeated by this technology. I told you, I gave examples, art provenance, DNA labeling, I mean, you name it. Everything will be blockchain, shipping, finance. Every single thing within 50 years will be founded almost exclusively on blockchain technology. So it's a massive, massive, possibly one of the five biggest revolutions, the equivalent of industrial revolution. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing to hear. Um, I think you kind of answered both. My next question on cryptocurrencies was exactly how uh, the institutions of today, the financial institutions of today would sort of deal with it. But you, you did touch upon that. One idea and that may, I had. And may I suggest after this interlude about, uh, let's move on to some other subject because this is becoming yeah. a program about yeah. cryptocurrencies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the next uh, topic we wanted to speak to you about was on uh, internet technologies, AI and data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a as a transition, maybe I, I would just throw the question out, and you can you can see if you want to just answer it. As uh, I just had this idea in one of your previous videos, you had mentioned that uh, there's a a problem of issuing trust on the internet, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, please do correct me if I'm misquoting you. But uh, I was thinking that you could use. Is it, is it a possible use case of using blockchain technologies to establish trust and authority on the, on the internet? Yeah, absolutely. I just said that every field mm. will be permeated by this technology. Of course, internet first. I mean, every field. And later on, well, later on, when I say later on, I mean 50, 60 years. For example, you will have forms of artificial intelligence. You will need to identify them. 
they will have personalities. They will be androids. They will look like people. You know, you will need to identify them. You will need to create provenance for these devices. Uh, they will evolve. They will work in different environments. They will absorb different types of data. They will be able to process big data, which humans cannot, or at least cannot in ways that machines do. And, um, and so on and so forth. So blockchain technology will underlie not only the internet, which is a, di a dying thing, by the way, not only the internet, but the next technologies. And above all, perhaps, when it comes to artificial intelligence, is the creation of device provenance. And um, because I think device provenance, possibly, arguably, could be the key obstacle to artificial intelligence. But we can discuss it a bit later. OK. Uh, yeah, so our, our next general question was, what are your views on AI and any lessons from history? And I am especially curious to hear your thoughts on universal basic income. There's some talk of that going on with the, in the uh, current US uh, presidential uh, campaigns. Uh, yeah, so. What 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 would where do you stand on these uh, on these topics? Well, there is a very underreported problem. To be honest, I seem to be the only one mentioning it, and I have no no idea why. Um, income inequality takes money out of circulation. Income inequality demonetizes the economy. What do I mean? If you have $10 million, you can spend them. You buy a yacht, you have an expensive lover. I mean, there are ways to spend $10 million. And if you have any problem with that, kindly write to me and I will show you. But what, what if you have $100 million? Well, it becomes a bit more difficult. Still, you can buy companies, you can open factories. I mean, it's still a manageable amount. What do you do when you have $50 billion? Let me tell you what you do. 95% of this amount stays in, a, in the bank, in vaults, or dumped into works of art, or buried underground somehow. 95% of $50 billion, billion with a B, dollars goes out of circulation because there is no human way to use 50 billion dollars never mind how hard you try i'm li i live in a country right now whose total gdp gross domestic product total economy is 10 billion dollars i mean 50 billion is like a mid-sized country and so when you have 50 billion dollars the bulk of this money will be buried somewhere, will be buried in treasuries, will be buried in savings, will be buried in physical, will be buried in diamonds, will be buried in works of art. I don't know, but will be buried, will not be productive because there's no way to recycle this money and to activate it. The greater income inequality becomes, and it is now the greatest since the 1920s. The greatest inequality, income inequality becomes, the more demonetized the economy becomes. Because rich people take money out of circulation. And therefore, less and less money, physical, I mean, money supply, less and less money is available to an ever-growing number of people because we keep multiplying. We keep adding 130 million people a year. And yet these 130 million extra, extra babies, extra mouths, they have less money to share than before. Why? Because Bill Gates just made another $4 billion and has no idea how to spend them because it's not humanly possible to spend them. And these 4, million, 4 billion are taken out of circulation. So this demonet demonetization, the bleeding of the economy, is possibly, possibly the greatest threat to financial and economic stability in the world today. I regard, like many others, like Piketty and others, I regard income inequality as the greatest, greatest ominous threat 
to the stability and the very existence of, the, of e economies the world over, not financial system, whole economies. And so guaranteed base income is a way to redistribute money, to re, it's like a blood transfusion. It's um, a way to re-monetize economies. And whatever is done to re-monetize economies, in my book, is a blessing. So I started off my life as a capitalist. In my 20s, I was, for example, a very rich man. So I started off as a capitalist, and I'm ending my life as a socialist. And that's the exact opposite of the famous saying, uh, if you are a socialist, when you're old, you don't have a head, a brain. And if you're not a socialist, when you are young, you don't have a heart. So I, I ended up a socialist. In this, but I ended up a socialist not for social reasons, definitely not for social justice reasons, or distributive justice reasons, or all this, in my book, uh, non nonsense. It's not out of moral percepts or ethical edicts that I support the redistribution of wealth. I support the redistribution of wealth be, simply to keep the body economic alive. We need money back in circulation. And if necessary, we should take it by force, by coercion, via taxation, otherwise, via guaranteed base incomes, via any stratagem that we can come up with. We need to put money in people's hands. Because otherwise, economies will die. Whole economies will die. And the rich people will not be affected by the death of economies. On the very contrary, but it's easy to prove that the worse, the worse the shape of the economy, the greater income inequality. Extremely easy to prove. In other words, rich people become much richer in times of strife and crisis. We can discuss this separately. Why? But it's a fact. So they have no vested interest in keeping the economy alive. They have a vested interest in killing it. The smaller people, the 99%, they have a vested interest in keeping it alive. And so we must monetize it. That's with regards to this. Now about artificial, in, artificial intelligence is a, a massive, massive, massive subject. In principle, I think the only salvation of the human species would be in merging with artificial forms of intelligence. In other words, I think n not only the future of the species, but the survival of the species crucially depend on our ability to integrate machinery into our wetware, into our circuits, and our ability to seamlessly put together brain and machine. I think if we fail in this crucial task, we will not survive as a species. But we will not survive as a species, not because of the hawking, hawking Elon Musk hysteria, you know? Like we'll not survive as a species because artificial intelligence will take over and they will be the next winning, winning species. In my humble opinion, that borders on nonsense. But we will not survive as a, as a species because there are underlying forces at work social trends, other trends, and mainly perhaps psychopathological trends at work that will, in my view, um, destroy the species. Now, when I say destroy the species, of course, of course, I'm not saying that there will be no human beings alive. There will be scatterings of human beings and so on, but they will not act as a species. Right now, Never mind how much we complain and how much we, we cry and how much we protest, we still, by and large, act coherently, cohesively, as a species. We, we have species awareness. And we, we act in ways that essentially benefit the species. We have global warming, we have climate change, so we get together. Yes, we get together slowly. Yes, there are people who deny climate change. I mean, yes, all this is true. But by and large, we act as a species to counter climate change. We faced off numerous threats throughout our history. The Black Death, starting with the Black Death, I don't know. We, we always acted as a species. 
It is the first time, perhaps, that some social and psychological trends threaten the cohesiveness of action and the coherence of the framework of the species. In other words, social and psychological trends that will tear us apart, keep us asunder, separate us, atomize us, make it impossible for us to act on the species level make it even impossible to act on the community level, make it even, even impossible for act on the family level, make it impossible for us to act except as atomized individuals. This is the apotheosis, the, this is the culmination of malignant individualism. We have come to a point that the torsion and the breakage forces are such that the species as an integrative framework, as an organizing principle, is about to disintegrate. And what will be left behind is billions and billions of people who have nothing to do with each other, not emotionally, not psychologically, and will not collaborate consequently. We'll find it very difficult to work in teams, for example. If you think this is dystopian, you're right. If you think it is unprecedented, you're wrong. Actually, the vast majority of human existence was exactly like this. We live in a period in human, in human history, in the history of the human species, that is an aberration, that is an exception. It started with agriculture. When we embarked on the uh, on agricultural enterprise, we were forced to act in communities. We were forced to create hyperstructures like cities. We were forced to begin to function as a species or die, go extinct. But that was only 5,000 years ago. Until 5,000 years ago, we were each to his own. We did not collaborate. We did not work together. We didn't do things together. There were tiny groups of five or six or three or two. And these groups fended off, fended off on, for themselves. Have a look at the last 5,000 years. Started with families, then became villages, then became cities, then became empires, then ended up with nation states, and now we have supranational entities like the European Union and so on. I mean, the trend is clear. Last 5,000 years saw a greater integration of humans working together on species wide projects. And this trend stopped, stopped dead in its tracks, I would say in the 1980s or 1990s. And now it's reversing very fast. And the, the manifestation of this reversal is social media. Ironically, it's called social. <laughs> it's anything but social. <laughs> so this is the, the expression of what I'm saying. The atomization is most distinct and visible and discernible when you look at social media. So social media, of course, didn't create this. Social media is a mere reflection, propagation and extension of these underlying social and psychological trends, which were, I think, first identified in the 1960s by a guy called De Beau, and later in the United States in 1974 by Christopher Lash. So, but this is where we're going. We are going to disintegrate as a species and to remain as atomized individuals, like, like hunter-gatherers, like hunter-gatherers, you know, 10,000 years ago. Now, we could have survived it in the savannah. When human societies, impromptu societies, improvised society, improvised societies, for, for example, an encampment, you see it among the native Native Americans, Indians. Yeah? You see how they they group together, they create clusters of tribes and so on, but they do it only only to hunt, and then they drift apart. In hunter-gatherer societies in the savanna, you could survive this way. You could work together and then not work together. You could be atomized and still survive. But in our modern environment the environment that we ironically had created for ourselves, the artificial 
artificial nature that we are in, the simulacrum, this universe, this virtual reality. Because what is a city? A city is the first example of virtual reality. So in this virtual reality, if we don't operate as a species, we're doomed. We're dead, literally. And the only hope to extricate us from this inevitable destiny is artificial intelligence. We must merge with artificial intelligence. We must seek to merge, exactly opposite what Elon Musk is saying. We must seek to merge with, with artificial intelligence. We must make it an integral part of our bodies, of our minds, of our work, of our family, of our environment, of our communities, of everything. It's the only hope. It's the only hope because artificial intelligence is not subject to the pernicious and toxic social and psychological trends, trends that have taken over in the past 25 years. It is, therefore, uncontaminated, unadulterated. It doesn't carry the germ of contagion. It's kind of an enclave of purity and health. And we must draw strength from this. By merging with artificial intelligence, we will have vitiated and negated and reversed the, the sick social and psychological trends that have taken over us. Now, if you think this is, again, if you think this is uh, revolutionary, it is. But if you think it's unprecedented, again, you would be wrong. Every juncture in human history, when the species was threatened, it was saved by new technology. Every. Think about it for a minute. Even in your lifetime or your father or your fathers and grandfathers lifetime. And you will see how right I am. Every time the species was threatened existentially, it was saved by adopting technology to the point of merging with technology. Because when you bring a radio set into your home, and after that, you bring a television into your home. And after that, you bring the inter a laptop or whatever, a personal computer at the time, into your home. It's that when you bring technology into your home, you have effected a merger. You have already merged. Look at how teenagers interact with their smartphones. They are merged with the smartphone. I always give the... the um, I always use screens as metaphors. I, uh, I was born when the last dinosaurs were going extinct. Um, and <laughs> it, it did. They didn't go extinct because of me, by the way. I mean, <laughs> some, some people say that, but that's libel. That is slander. I didn't do anything to any dinosaur. <laughs> but, but anyhow, they went extinct. I couldn't help it. So at that time, there was this gigantic screen. It was like a piece of real estate, a normal screen. And 2,000 of us would cram into a hole, a physical structure. And we would sit and we would smoke and we would talk and we would throw popcorn at each other and we would make out and worse. And we would do many, many things facing that screen on which a series of images unfolded. You're too young to remember, but that screen was called cinema. And then years have passed and the screen became considerably smaller. Remember, the first screen, big as it were, allowed 2,000 people to congregate and to create, to have human interactions and to create, in effect, an impromptu, short-term, improvised community, ad hoc community. And then the screen became a lot smaller and entered the home. And then... 20 people could sit around, 20, 30, if they're not fat, sit around and watch that screen together and have to, something to eat and drink and talk and compare experiences. And everyone saw the same program because there were only three channels. And that screen was called television. But while the first screen allowed 2,000 people to share the same experience, television allowed only 30 people to share the same experience. When it, when it got fragmented, when you begin to have, to have cable, cable television. Time has passed, and then the screen became even smaller. And now 
three, four people, only three, four people, could sit around that screen and play video games or collaborate on a document and so on. And that screen was called personal computer, for good reason, it was personal. And then it became smaller and became the laptop and only two people could work together. And then it became the smartphone. And today, only you can interact with your smartphone. Yes, there are technologies like Bluetooth and this and that, but who, who uses them? I mean, essentially, only you interact with your smartphone. It's a one person technology. It's an anti-community technology. It's a technology that monopolizes you and removes you from other people, cuts you off. You don't have to believe me. Go to an airport and have a look at a gaggle, gaggle of teenagers, girls and boys, who used to be motivated by their hormones, now mo are motivated by their Instagrams. They don't pay attention to each other. Gorgeous girls to die for, amazingly handsome boys, sit next to each other, utterly ignoring each other, immersed and buried in their one-person screen. This is the technology of atomization. This is the technology that, will, that is tearing us apart, that is rending the fabric of all the institutions we've ever created. This is a technology not only of self-sufficiency, but of self-idolization, as, as expressed via social media. So the trend is so clear, you don't need a genius with 190 IQ to tell you that. The trend is towards solipsism, isolation, atomization, and alienation. These trends are utterly clear. They were clear to Emil Durkheim many decades ago. He called it anomie. He predicted that it will lead to a massive increase in the rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide. An amazing prediction, which came absolutely true, especially among people between the ages of 15 and 25. So, and what's the, what's the solution to all this? Artificial intelligence. None other, unfortunately. I'm saying unfortunately because it's not an optimal solution. Far from it. But it is the only solution we have. We need to merge with artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is built on completely different principles. Completely different principles. For example, artificial intelligence is built on learning, lifelong learning. Our society is built on something called malignant egalitarianism, something I call malignant egalitarianism. Like, I'm as much an expert as you are. You have nothing to teach me. I can learn nothing from you, you know. I have my truth, you have your truth. There are facts and there are alternative facts. There is, you know, truthism and so on. So our society now is built around the implicit and not so implicit assumption that everyone is an expert and therefore no one can teach anyone anything. Artificial intelligence is built in exactly the opposite principle. Lifelong learning, hierarchical learning. Artificial intelligence is community and team oriented by its very structure. It's built on distributed, uh, distributed parallel computing and so on and so forth. If you look at artificial intelligence, it embodies the most noble species principles, actually. I don't know why. Was it because the inventors and creators of artificial intelligence were such noble people? or because they had discovered, as nature had, that teamwork, collaboration, and community, and learning are critical to self-propagation, self-replication, and survival. And so they had to embed it in artificial intelligence, even, even if they were revolted by these principles. They still had to embed it. So artificial intelligence is an antidote to the poison that is modern life. I, that's how I regard it. I am exactly on the opposite pole of Elon Musk. I <laughs> welcome, I welcome fusion between men and machine. Welcome it. Hope for it.
could you give me uh, an example a practical example of how this merger with ai would sort of play out because the way i see applications of ai are right now in like self driving cars or better search personalized search but how does a human who is now merged with ai uh, come out of this atomize this trend of atomization no the applications you've mentioned are erroneously of course called ai uh, they are actually big data uh, people often conflate the two even artificial intelligence researchers conflate the two the ability to process huge amounts of data in real time and based on heuristics uh, reach some conclusions and make some recommendations or affect some actions or act in an executive capacity this is not artificial intelligence <laughs> this is uh, this is processing power raw raw processing power in effect this is exactly exactly what underlies big blue or the computer that defeated uh, kasparov in in, ch in chess games you know this is an extension of Babbage by other means or Turing by other means. Um, it's a universal machine that has processing power and can, you know, act universally. That's not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the ability to create a view of the world that incorporates oneself, first of all, the ability to introspect to create a model of the world which includes the observer. That's, that's the first hallmark of true artificial intelligence, the kind of artificial intelligence I'm talking about, the kind of artificial intelligence that is being studied and developed by true scholars of artificial intelligence, not by the ones who work for Microsoft and, and Google and so on. And artificial intelligence is hyped because it sounds good, you know. Alexa suddenly is artificial intelligence, Siri is artificial intelligence, utter, total, unmitigated nonsense, you know. So the first test of true artificial intelligence is introspection with the model of the world that includes the observer that had created the model. The second test is versatility of intelligence. And there I made a minor contribution when I was 17. Versatility of intelligence. That means to identify the essentials out of a plethora, out of a panoply of seemingly disparate phenomena. phenomena. Think about a very simple thing, chair, chairs. There are a zillion, a zillion shapes of chairs, but there is chairness. There is an essence that makes something a chair. It is this essence that should be captured and would allow uh, artificial intelligence to identify something as a chair. Now, we humans, we do it very well. We can look at something we've never, ever seen before and say, oh, that looks like a chair. Although it has nothing in common with any chair we've ever seen. So we are very good at this, distilling the essence, extracting the essence. The third element is learning, but learning in a self-recursive way and not learning by rote, not learning by memorizing, the, the, uh, memorizing Wikipedia or not learning by sorting through uh, trillions of transactions, insurance transactions. That's not learning. I, said, I say again, this is raw processing power and heuristics. I'm talking about fuzzy learning, learning that is uh, very flexible, that is adaptable, that changes, that identify a variety of processes as learning and so on and so forth. So the capacity to learn. The fourth element, I think, and so the, sorry, the capacity to learn also implies the capacity to evolve. And when I say evolution, I don't mean that artificial intelligence will have uh, two gigabytes of memory and then it will become four gigabytes of memory. That's not evolution. When I say evolution, I mean learning that transforms the underlying, the underlying procedure of program into something unrecognizable 
to its author. So if you write an AI program, and essentially all AI is programs, robots are not AI. Again, we make this confusion. I mean, very often you will hear someone say, oh, here's AI, and they, they, they indicate an, a robot. Robot is an automaton, it's, it's automata theory, it's not artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is strictly programs, programming. So when the author of such a program embeds in it the capacity to change itself in ways that would render it unrecognizable to him, that's artificial intelligence. So not only learning, but transformative learning and transformative to the point that an entire identity changes and the program is no longer recognizable. Even its functions are no longer clear. So this is the element of fuzziness. The more fuzzy the program, the, the more artificial intelligence it is. It is precisely these ambiguities, these, this equivocation, this ambivalence that makes us the ultra self-efficacious machines that we are. We adapt to every environment, to every challenge, to every development, to every, because we are not rigidly programmed. We are programmed to deprogram, reprogram, and change beyond recognition. Very often we surprise ourselves. Very often we surprise others and shock them. Very often there are glitches in the program, so we have serial killers and psychopaths and so on. Yes, it's all true. But this is the core of, of intelligence. So the last requirement, I think, from a good, from the kind of artificial intelligence I'm talking about, is the ability to self-replicate. And again, when I say self-replicate, I don't mean sex. <laughs> Your mind is in the gutter, I can see. Okay, so I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean sex in this sense. When I say self-replicate, I mean the ability to create unfaithful copies of oneself. Copies of oneself that are not the same as oneself. This is a crucial, crucial requirement for artificial intelligence. Now, if you look at all these requirements, you'll immediately identify one entity that complies with all of them, human beings. Yeah. Because the last requirement, for example, the ability to self-replicate unfaithfully, not exactly, is what we call children. So, in effect, a good artificial intelligence program would come extremely close to a human being extremely imitate a human being almost to perfection and therefore would never feel alien although there is a concept invented in 1970 by a japanese roboticist his name was mori and he said that uh, if we create artificial intelligence that is sufficiently reminiscent of a human being we would feel extremely uncomfortable he called it the uncanny valley he said that we would feel that this piece of artificial intelligence which resembles us is uncanny, you know, a bit unsettling. Maybe, could be, but we should overcome this trifle, you know, this bad feeling. The closer the artificial intelligence program is to us, the easier it would be for us to merge with it and also to understand it. Now, there is this assumption by the likes of Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and others, there is this assumption that artificial intelligence is also alien intelligence. I mean, if Elon Musk was to stop for a minute and think about what he's saying, he's actually not attacking artificial intelligence. He is attacking alien intelligence. He says, if we develop artificial intelligence, it would be so non-human. It would be so non-human that it would be inhuman. And we would never be able to understand it, its motivation, its sinister plans. It's so, but of course, in my view, there is, in all these paranoid um, ruminations, there is a, a, an embedded serious mistake. 
it's not possible to have alien intelligence. There is no such thing. All intelligence must be identical all over the universe. On all the planets, in all the laboratories, in all computer programs, in all forms of storage of intelligence, carbon-based, like us, silicon-based tomorrow, all intelligence must be the same. I can discuss it, but I don't want to take too much of a program. Intelligence must be identical, wherever it is. It can never ever be alien. In other words, there is absolutely no risk that we will not understand what our creations have in mind, have in their silicon mind. We will understand what they have in mind because they will be us. How do I know that future artificial intelligence will be essentially human? Because we have intelligence. They have intelligence. Therefore, we have the same intelligence. The minute you have the same intelligence, you can predict. The minute you can predict, forewarned is forearmed. You can predict, you can prevent. I'm not worried at all. I'm not worried at all because I believe that there is only one species of intelligence, not multiple. While Elon Musk assumes that there is our intelligence and then, the, and then there is artificial intelligence, which is another form of intelligence, which we will never be able to, to anticipate. And so it can take over. I, I disagree wholeheartedly. There's only one form of intelligence, only in different containers, different ways, using different materials. Yes, I agree, but it's the same intelligence. That is a fascinating way to look at. So in, in a sense, the maximum threat from this kind of an intelligence would be the same level of threat that one human faces from another human. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And also, we will have the same glitches. You will have serial killer yeah. artificial intelligence. You will have psychopaths artificial in intelligence. There is a risk, a serious risk from artificial intelligence. And that is uh, in, the work in the workplace. Artificial intelligence will replace many jobs, many of today's jobs. That's a serious risk. It's an economic risk. It is already doing it. It will replace many jobs, and many of the people who occupy these jobs don't have the intelligence <laughs> needed to transition to higher level jobs. So if I work in a factory and I'm a blue collar worker, and you know, I'm not the brightest star in the galaxy, and I'm replaced by a robot, I cannot suddenly become a robot engineer, you know, because had I been able to be a robot engineer, I would have been a robot engineer and not a blue collar worker. So the displacement of working class blue collar jobs, uneducated, largely uneducated people around the world is a serious, very big threat. This job displacement is enormous. These people cannot be reskilled, cannot be retrained. They cannot transition to other jobs. They simply can't. That's why they ended up being blue collar workers. And we don't have the slightest hint of a shadow of a solution on how to resolve this issue. That's the real threat from artificial intelligence. And it's coming. It's coming faster than people imagine. By 2030, according to McKinsey, 40% of all jobs in the world will be supplanted by artificial intelligence. Now, where will these 40% people, of people go? We are talking anywhere between, uh, I don't know, one, one to 1 1.2 billion jobs. Where will these people go? How will they make a living? Even, even stratagems or plans or programs like you know, basic wages, I mean, they will not survive such a strain. It's an enormous strain. The transfer of resources required to, to you know, support even a minimal social safety network for these people will destroy whole whole economies. No way to no way to do this. No way. And the result will be Donald Trumps, Dutertes, Bolsonaro's, and other. I don't want to say exactly what comes to my mind. The result will be political extremism, radicalization 
intolerance, xenophobia, extreme social tensions, and ultimately warfare, of course. Because the only way to resolve excess population effectively, the only two ways to resolve excess population effectively, is plagues, courtesy nature, and wars, courtesy the United States. I mean, these are the two ways. <laughs> <laughs> these are the two ways we know on how to control population. And we need to control population because shortly there will be 1.5 billion unnecessary people with no jobs, no prospects, and a lot of anger. And this is a direct result of artificial intelligence. Or robotics, at least, which is, you know, allied branch. Now, that's a threat. Elon Musk is talking about the uprising of artificial intelligence and how they will take over the White House. You could only wish, you could only dream this should happen. I mean, anything would be better than Donald Trump. Yeah? <laughs> but, but I'm talking about something which will happen in 10 years, which could rend the world, which could ruin the world. I mean, put it to fire. I mean, what is the Great Depression? It's a, it's a joke compared to this. It's a nothing. It's a footnote. We are talking Great Depression multiplied by a thousand. And who will solve this? We don't have we don't have the institutional frameworks. We don't have the money. And we don't have, of course, the political will. And uh, unscrupulous political leaders like Donald Trump, but I mentioned Trump, but Trump is, is the best among a gaggle of, of such leaders. Uh, you can mention Duterte, you can mention Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro, you can mention Netanyahu, you can mention Putin, you can, I mean, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, and some would say Modi in India. So these unscrupulous leaders uh, will capitalize on this crest of, of rage and, and displacement and anger and lack of solutions and so on. They are capitalizing. We are just starting. This is the real threat from robotics and artificial intelligence. Mm. Is there, I mean, what would you advise to policymakers? Because policymakers are clearly lagging behind when it comes to understanding of these technologies. I don't know if you are aware of Andrew Yang in the U.S. presidential uh, yeah, the uh, democratic uh, candidate. Yeah. He's the only person who exactly says what you said, you know, that Donald Trump was elected partly, majorly because of this level of automation. It's coming faster than you think. We don't have any systems in place. But is there, have we, is the momentum of this trend too strong to stop? Or is there something that governments and policymakers can do at this point? There is, but they will never do it, of course. There are two ways to go about it. The Marxist way, and the Marxist way is simply, Artificial intelligence and robotics will create such will create such surplus, and this surplus can be distributed to the disenfranchised. So if you wait, let's say 10, 20 years, and these 10 to 20 years will be very difficult. There will be years of transition. There will be a lot of strife, a lot of rage, a lot of this, a lot of that. But at the end of these 20 years, machines will have created so much surplus value uh, added added value, yes, because machines are much more efficient than human beings. So they will have created so much surplus that then you can simply take the surplus and distribute it via unilateral transfers. Uh, for example, social benefits. So you can distribute this this surplus created by machines to pacify the masses. That's one way of doing it, and that's that system is called communism. Uh, the second way is to reconsider our value system. Our value system is founded on the Industrial Revolution, and it's known as liberal capitalism. In the Industrial Revolution, what has happened is people willingly surrendered uh, their time and their work to machines which knew these machines were built or constructed to create excess value, surplus value. And this surplus value was distributed asymmetrically between the owners of the machines, the owners of the capital, and the users of the machines, the workers. So at that period, we created liberal capitalism. But liberal capitalism was able to survive for one reason only, colonialism. 
when we cr when we had excess labor, we exported the labor from the West to Africa, to India, to the Middle East. So colonialism was actually uh, exporting excess labor to prevent labor unrest at home and to maximize surplus creation by machinery and its owners. And it worked for a while. It worked because the number of colonies was infinite <laughs> compared to the home to the homelands. The homelands were tiny and the colonies were gigantic. I mean, take into account, for example, Congo. Congo was the size of the entire Western Europe. So the colonies were gigantic, homelands were tiny, and the, this discrepancy allowed liberal capitalism to survive for 200 years. Today, we don't have this, this uh, safety valve anymore. We can't export our excess labor. We are now, the global economy, what we call globalization, wrongly, by the way, but never mind, what we call globalization is actually uh, attempts to trade surpluses, attempts to somehow defray or compensate for surpluses. We cannot export surplus labor. So what we do instead, we try to export, well, except countries that export workers. So they have remittances as the main source of income. But these are few countries. Majority of uh, industrialized countries cannot export labor. So what they do instead, they are trying to export their, their surplus. And this is called international trade. And this is coming to an end for the simple reason. All industrialized countries have reached the same level of mechanization, same level, level of automation, same level of, level of productivity. There are no productivity differentials. So all industrialized countries create surpluses. They all create surpluses. And of course, you can't. International trade is grinding to a halt, effectively. Growth in international trade is very close to zero in real terms, inflation adjusted. Because that's it. I mean, China has as much surplus as the United States. The United States has as much surplus as Germany. Germany, I mean, and that's the end of the story. That's it. And they all create everything. So, like, they don't have what used to be called relative advantage, you know. So the surplus age is coming to an end. Uh, the surplus, the global surplus age is coming to an end. Let me, before I go to the next phase of global economics, let me summarize the previous two. So there was, a, uh, starting with the Industrial Revolution, I'm not talking about agriculture, agriculture was a different story. Industrial Revolution. Starting with the Industrial Revolution, the first solution liberal capitalism found was to export labor via colonialism. Okay, that failed in the 1960s. So there, there was a second solution, international trade. International trade, which started in earnest at the end of the 19th century, allowed countries to export not their labor, but their surplus production. And that is coming to an end because all countries are now industrialized. In 1911, United States could export to China. It had an export surplus with China because China didn't have machinery didn't have automation, didn't have scientists, didn't have anything. Today, the United States cannot export to China, except maybe soybeans. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so today, the second phase of liberal capitalism is coming to an end, and that is surplus exchange. Labor exchange, colonialism, surplus exchange, international trade, also coming to an end. So we are entering the third and last phase of liberal capitalism. And in this sense, it's really the end of history. Apropo Fukuyama, yes? So we are, we are entering the, the last phase. And the last phase is uh, taking surpluses and instead of trading them globally, redistribu redistributing them internally to prevent unrest. Pacification, I call it. It's the pacification phase of liberal capitalism. And it could be facilitated only via automation and artificial intelligence. Another reason to embrace the technologies. So what robotic, robotics had created, had wrought, robotics will fix. We will ultimately start programs like base wage, like 
uh, enhanced social benefits, like Obamacare. Obamacare was an example of this. You know, we are beginning to take surpluses and distribute them, distribute them to the to internally, not externally. So international trade will shrink as a as a share of global GDP. International trade will shrink, and unilateral transfers within countries, creating social safety networks, will increase dramatically. And the key question for the pacification phase of global economics, the key question would be, are we going to create clever programs of redistributing the surplus? A stupid program is to take $200 and to give $200 to each family. That's a stupid program. A clever program is to give $200 in education credits so that if you go to college, the government will give you $200 that you can use only to pay college tuition. That's a clever redistributive program. So this, this, as you can see already in the 2020 debates, this, this will be the key issue of the future. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is all about this. This will be the key. This will be the key arguments of, of, of the future in economics. How to create programs to pacify a restless society and a restless population, to pacify the losers in the global economy, how to create programs to pacify them by redistributing surpluses created by robotics and artificial intelligence, but redistributing them in such a way that they will be productive and grow the economy further, for example, via education or health. That's how I see it. Well, uh, I'd like to make a small transition from AI to uh, psychology, if you don't mind, and I have a few questions related to parent, the relationship between parenting and children. Uh, according to you, uh, what are the biggest mistakes that parents make while raising children? And uh, what, are, what that would make, cause a lot of damage to children or traumatize children while growing up? Anything that prevents a child from separating from the parent and becoming an individual, a process we call separation individuation. Anything that prevents this process, anything that prevents a child from forming non-porous boundaries uh, with that parent, anything like that creates dysfunction and is bad for the child. The main role of the parent is to push the child away. That's the main role of a good parent. And unfortunately, uh, parenting, especially in the West, but not only in the West, for example, in China as well, um, parenting had come to symbolize the exact opposite. Parenting is perceived today as a protective function. It is the role of the parent to put the child through college. The child can continue to live with the parent until he is 30. The child is cosseted, spoiled. The, the ch child receives all kinds of services at home, like laundry. The child is, I don't know what. I mean, parents today, all over the world, are doing the exact opposite of good parenting. The role of a good parent is to force the child to separate, to go away, to become an individual, to create boundaries, clear boundaries, and to fend the parent off when the parent transgresses on these boundaries, which parents often tend to do because they love the child. What parents do today is they merge with the child. They, they transform the child's personality and the child's goals and the child's life into their own, thereby rendering the child an extension or an instrument of gratification or an invalid in need of protection, or a beggar in need of money and shelter. So. Hello? Yes, I said simple, which indicates an, an end to the answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't yeah. know how many of you, it sounds like you're the sole survivor. Titanic, no. <laughs> They're all Titanic had a better rate than this, imagine. <laughs> uh, because, uh, Right now, uh, our generation, those who are born in the 90s, we grew up without 
the smartphone and with the smartphone but that cannot be said for the current generation so some of my uh, uh, some of my friends who have children uh, uh, they are uh, they're like age 2 or 3 and they're given smartphones at that young age and made to watch youtube videos for distractions uh, that is not a healthy trend i believe do you also see it that way Okay, you asked me about good parenting, so I'm, I'm answered more generally. Yeah. More specifically, yeah. about the use of smartphones. Smartphones, we have had, uh, we have quite a big body of studies. Yeah. Uh, most recently, by Twen, uh, Twenge and uh, Campbell, but before her, before them, also. So we have quite a, a substantial and convincing body of studies that shows that smartphones. and even more specifically social media but they are usually inextricably linked like if you have a smartphone you're on social media so smartphones and social media separately and definitely in conjunction have a severely deleterious effect bad effect on mental health that's to start with they in- increase rates of anxiety and depression for example by factors of 5 and 3 respectively they increase suicide among teens who use smartphones and social media extensively rate of suicide is anywhere between 50% and 5 times higher depending on the on the demographics so bad mental health effects second thing smartphones and social media have antisocial effects and um, retard socialization and the ability to interact socially including by the way sexual activity or sexual interest for example dating dropped more than 50% among teenagers who are using smartphones and social media dating which is the most basic function teenagers i mean that's it's almost something you can, you <laughs> I, you can't control you know you want to date i mean but, but no they are not interested um the sexual experiences among people younger than 25 in Japan deteriorated by close to 80% i mean about 60% of japanese youth have never had a sexual experience at all of any kind by the way not losing your virginity or something just any sexual experience any contact with the opposite sex or with the same sex doesn't matter no sexual experience i'm mentioning sex because it is universally perceived in psychology as the force of life we don't use the word sex in psychology we use the word libido it's a force of life if sex disappears as a motivating uh, as a, as a motivation in the life of a teenager i don't know for me it smacks of death it smells it stinks of death you know there's something dead about these people i have been observing teenagers for at least 3 or 4 years now in in a structured way in some studies i've conducted and also as a professor i've been teaching for for 8 years now and i don't know there's something dead about these people about these generations something i would say mechanical in the elon musk sort of way mechanical bed mechanical dead mechanical robotic total lack of interest in the other not lack of empathy by the way the new generations are actually to some extent more empathic and more tolerant than previous generations but empathic and tolerant in a kind of abstract way invested in the principle of empathy in the principle of tolerance but avoiding all social interaction where these principles can be actually tested so while on questionnaires they would appear to be more empathic and more tolerant they never have an opportunity to exercise this principle because they rarely meet majority of teenagers have reported since 2006 that they vastly prefer to talk to each other via social media than to meet face to face it's bad the picture is bad and to give your child a smartphone because smartphone is not a neutral neutral device it's not a neutral device it's like giving your child the key to a door beyond which 
there is a highly specific kingdom, a highly specific landscape. A smartphone is a gateway. It's not a neutral device, like, for example, a refrigerator. So to give your child this key, this gateway, when your child is two or three years old, is criminal. Nothing short of criminal. The effects on the child's social skills, child's mental health, child's ability to interact with peers, child's cognitive functions, because smartphones create severe cognitive deficits, inability to perceive reality properly, uh, blurring of the boundaries between virtual and real, and so on. I mean, uh, the damage is extensive. When the child is eight years old or nine years old, they already have defenses, and the effect will be lessened. Even so, we find extreme effects, extreme bad effects, well into age 25. Only after 25, there is sufficient resilience where actually these devices, devices stop having any effect, negative or positive. But up to age 25, and these are the studies of Twenge and Campbell, up to age 25, these devices are destructive, destructive. And not only in one field, not only in one area, not only in one dimension, in everything. Utterly destructive, in everything. If you use a smartphone as a reference tool, go for it. I mean, biggest library on earth. If you use smartphone in smart ways, yes. But unfortunately, unscrupulous entrepreneurs have come up with technologies that create addiction and conditioning. And of course, uh, Facebook is an example, yes? Knowingly create addiction and conditioning. How do I know that it was knowingly? Because the engineers of Facebook and Google outed and confessed that the aim was to create addiction and conditioning. So it's bad. It's a bad scene. And to throw your child into the... It's exactly like taking your child into a pedophile club. I don't know what example can I give. It's, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> introducing him to life. You know, come, honey, let, let, I, I want to show you a few pedophiles. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. And I just want to share quickly, uh, this was my experience as well, because I've been on social media since, I think, MySpace that had come out almost every single day of my life. And in July this month, I took like a month off. Right. It was amazing. The, it was so relaxing. I actually was more social. I went and met my neighbors. I introduced them, made some really good friends. And yeah, it was, it was a, I'm, I'm completely off it. And also partly watching your video, which really drills it in, you know, that what, what is going on. And Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, who was a fictitious character, of course, said some very non-fictitious things. And one of the things he said was, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Yeah. So have a look at Facebook. Facebook makes money uh, when you watch the screen, when you post, when you like, when you interact with the application. Only then Facebook makes money. Facebook does not make money when you're away from the screen. So Facebook needs your eyes. Facebook needs you to be glued to the screen. They need you to click. They need you to like. They need you to read. They need you to write. They need you there. Why? Because the more you do so, the more money they make. But if you have a girlfriend, she competes with Facebook. Did you think about it? If you have a girlfriend, she's taking your eyes away. Well, it depends how she looks. But she's taking your <laughs> eyes away. She's taking your eyes away from the screen. Your girlfriend costs Facebook money. So Facebook doesn't like your girlfriend. I would go even further. Facebook doesn't like it that you have a girlfriend. Because having a girlfriend reduces Facebook's profits. Having a friend reduces profits. Being a part of a community, a charity organization, a volunteer, anything, anything outside the screen reduces Facebook's profits. Now, Facebook is profit-oriented. I don't know if it occurred to you. And because it's profit-oriented, 
exactly like Sherlock Holmes said. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. If Facebook is profit oriented, they will do everything they can to sabotage all your real life relationships except your relationship with Facebook. Period. End of story. And how will they do this? How will they accomplish this? By conditioning you, by addicting you, so that your girlfriend will have much less allure, influence on you, and attraction than Facebook, because you'll be addicted to Facebook, by converting you into a junkie. Simple, really simple. Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Uh, another question I have is very uh, personalized. Uh, in the beginning, you had mentioned that uh, you don't really find sports very interesting, but I do have a sports question. You don't no mind way. me asking? I have no <laughs> idea. I know nothing about sports. I swear uh, to you that you can ask me about any topic. I mean, biology, astrophysics, you name it. I make it a point, I make it a point to know everything about everything, except sports and cars. And women, I thought but, I knew some things, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this is just a psychological effect uh, that martial arts and combat sports have on human beings. Because I have been practicing martial arts and I have felt a change in myself. But I would like your views on it, whether practicing martial arts has a positive influence on a person's psyche. Not martial arts per se, but the philosophy, yeah. the philosophy underlying martial arts, the Buddha. So it's not the martial arts. If you practice martial arts as an extension of its underlying philosophy, then it has very positive effects. If you practice martial arts as martial arts, just, I don't know, to be strong, to protect yourself, or to beat up people, of course it's a negative thing. It's a transformation of aggression. The irony is that all the philosophies underlying all martial arts are essentially very peaceful philosophies. They are philosophies of self-control self-containment, pacifying your enemy, and so on. So they are very uh, healthy, mature, growth-promoting philosophies. And the martial art is just using the body to express these philosophies by pre precision movement, by leveraging your opponent's strength, by, you know. So if you practice out of the philosophy, you're safe and you will, you're good, you're, you will grow. It's a growth thing growth promoting thing but if you but like everything else it can be abused of course it can be abused if you focus on the physical manifestations of martial arts only that's how i see it i've just visited a, a Taoist shrine in um, rostov on don in russia of all places and the uh, the two people there demonstrated a dance of swords. In, in Taoism, they have like a dance with swords. And it was amazing, their precision, their control, their, their tranquility, their immersion in the dance. Uh, to, it was a form of meditation with swords, you know. But of course, had they not been into the philosophy, and both these people have been into the philosophy, one of them spent 20 years in Japan, and so, so had they not been in, into the philosophy, they would have focused on the swords. They would have considered the swords as cutting instruments, or instruments of deterrence, or instruments of harming someone. But as it were, the dance that I witnessed, which was utterly hypnotic, it was a dance focused on inner tranquility, on inducing inner peace, on self-control, on precision movement. On, I mean, it was amazing. It was like beautiful choreography. And so the philosophy is, is what matters. The, the, the physical manifestation of the philosophy is far less important. Mm. That's my and, Yeah. Uh, we're slowly coming towards the end, and I will just ask you one last question, and then uh, we'll wrap the, you're, this, not, this up. you're not the only one looking to end me, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, uh, I watched a documentary on uh, the effects of uh, 
electromagnetic radiations like Wi-Fi signals and cell phones uh, uh, radiations. And there was some mention of like how uh, people who live near uh, cell phone towers uh, tended to develop uh, cancer. And uh, there are now, again, it's sort of there's this big divide. There are some people, at least the technology industry is always saying like it's harmless and there's nothing. But there's this growing body of people who are also... Uh, coming up with these symptoms. So I just wanted to know if you researched this uh, sort of domain and what would you have to share about uh, that? Yeah. Especially I, I, that we are heading into the 5G uh, spectrum. And yeah. uh, I also read that 5G can be absorbed by water and you know, that it could be potentially dangerous for us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in the process of reactivating my medical degree. I'm a medical doctor. But I consider to start practicing somehow as well so that I can merge it, merge it with psychology and become a psychiatrist. But so in this process, one of the things I studied is this actually, by mistake. <laughs> and um, so first of all, cluster analysis is performed routinely by the Center for Disease, uh, CDC in the United States and other bodies, WHO, on a global level. And at this stage, there hasn't been any correlation. No one found clusters of cancer next to cell phone towers or any other devices connected to cell phones directly or indirectly. And that is very reminiscent of the anti-vaccination movement uh, with its vocal, vocal nonsensical critics and so on. This pertains to all technologies up to 4G. 5G technology, there are no sufficient studies. So when it comes to 5G, no one knows. That's the answer. Not that you know that it's detrimental, but simply no one knows. And studies are being conducted and have been commissioned, but the results will be in three to five years. So 5G is a substantially, substantially different technology. It's not like an extension of 3G or 4G or 3G and 4G amplified. It's not. It uses different parts of a spectrum and so on. So it's sufficiently, sufficiently different to 3G and 4G to warrant totally separate studies, including cluster analysis studies. But at this stage, we, we as a medical profession, we have no answer to this. We don't know. The studies just started. We may discover in three to five years that actually, yes, it does have detrimental impact or um, uh, some uh, pathogenic impact. And we may discover that it's nothing. Now, as far as physics go, which, another one of my hats, I'm a physicist, as far as physics go, there should not be any impact on the human brain or any other systems, body systems, should not be, uh, using these parts, these frequencies and parts of a spectrum and the method of modulation and so on, shouldn't be, in principle. But I would be, I would err on the side of caution here, because the combination is un unprecedented, unheard of. We have no experience, not even remotely. So absolutely, there's need for studies on 5G. I would even go as far as saying that governments should not hurry to implement 5G um, systems in place, telecommunication systems, before these studies had been conducted and completed. And that hurrying to do so, for example, with Huawei in, in some countries, like in France and United Kingdom, where they're implementing 5G with Huawei. So I think it's crass commercial interests because I think in any other field, uh, they would have waited for medical results before, you know, to see if the technology is, is harmful. But that is strictly 5, uh, 5G. We have, I don't know how many studies over the last 40 years with 3G and, and, and over the last 20 years with 4G, and there's absolutely nothing, no statistical significance whatsoever of any kind, cancer or any other disease, nothing. Okay. So, uh, we still have, I think, a lot of uh, uh, big list of topics to dive in, but I think for today we'll bring it in to an end. Yeah, we also we, can, always, some we to... can always do another show someday. Perfect. Thank We're you, yeah, you so really much. happy to, to have that. And I think I, and I'll also speak for everyone here, is we'll also like to re-listen to this whole thing a couple of times to really make sure we digest everything that was said. And, my, co my, uh, condol my condolences. <laughs> 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 and uh, it was an absolute pleasure uh, speaking Thank to you. Thank you, mutual.
Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Intelligent, intelligent questions. Intelligent questions elicit intelligent answers. I hope. And I would be delighted <laughs> to. I'd be delighted to be your guest again. So, let's put this up. I will put it on. I place it on my channel as well. Yeah. And yeah. then then we'll see how it goes, and and we can schedule something in a few weeks or a few months, and so. Okay. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, guys. Thank you. Success yeah. with your podcast. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. You too.